Hey, y'all. I'm Bud Elliott, and this is my College Football Summer School Series on Cover 3. I bring on the team experts from the 24-7 sports staff and ask them the questions I care about. No fluff. Which players will be toughest to replace? What position groups are sneakily better or worse than I realize? We get you the scoop on each team in 20 minutes or less. Let's go. Hey, guys. Welcome back into Bud Elliott's College Football Summer School here on the Cover 3 podcast. Today, I'm going way out west, northwest. That's Washington State. We're going to bring in Jamie Vinnick, kookfan.com, longtime Washington State guy, to talk and break down this Washington State team. Jamie, welcome back to the show, man. Appreciate you having me back on, bud. Absolutely. So uh, a, a pretty nice you know, debut year last last year for Jake Dickert, 7-6 and six, uh, in, in the record column, uh, top 45-ish in the power rankings. That's that's pretty good you know, for Washington State. It had to be a, an exciting and interesting year to cover after after the coaching transition. Yeah, it was definitely an easier year to cover. <laughs> we'll start with that than uh, the tumultuous 2021. Um, you know, things just kind of went as as a college football season should. You know, there was no crazy storylines um, in terms of vaccination status and coaching changes. But, um, you know, it was a lot easier to cover. But it was a fun season to cover. You know, they played some exciting games and obviously um, some games that they want back and games that they weren't able to close. And I think that was a big emphasis in the offseason is, you know, how do we go into a fourth quarter and not get run off the field and end up turning, you know, a, a four-point deficit into a 14-point deficit or a 10-point a lead into a, a loss? So that was kind of, I think, the, the big storyline of the season is, you know, while winning seven games is, you know, there was a feeling that they left some wins out on the table, that they had a shot to beat Oregon, they had a shot to beat Utah, um, and that they just weren't able to execute down the stretch. But overall, I think it was a um, a positive season for for Washington State with a new coaching staff with so much turnover on the roster, new coordinators, um, new personnel that, you know, you get to seven wins. And, and obviously there's certain schools where that's not OK. But I think for where Washington State was at a seven win season and getting to a bowl game pretty much met the standards of what was expected going into the year. I'm not intentionally trying to start negative here. Just, I, I usually start an offense in these. I, I had the offense 75th, which is not you know horrid, but it's it's nowhere near what I thought this thing was going to be, you know, last, last June, what, what happened that this offense wasn't, you know, like, like a top half, top third offense in college football. Yeah. I think the learning curve for Cam Ward was a little bit bigger than expected. Um, and he wasn't bad last year by any means, but he wasn't the dominant figure that I think kook fans and, and even some national people thought he could be. I mean, he was one of the highest rated transfers coming out of the portal last year. And it, it was just a bit more of a learning curve. I, I think he was a little surprised at times that, the defenses that he had to deal with. Obviously, I think the big issue was the offensive line. It just was not good last year. They had some injuries. Um, they had lost a lot of guys. You know, I think it was one of the biggest uh, letdowns from the Rolovich era that the offensive line just was not developed well enough. Um, and I think, you know, Clay McGuire came in. He did what he could. But, you know, when you're having to plug in a guy like Falili Fa'amoe midway through the season, and he's, you know, developed into a nice right tackle, but this was a guy who was playing defensive tackle last January and suddenly is playing starting steps at, at right tackle. So the offensive line, I think, was a letdown. And I think the receiver play was a disappointment. I think a lot of people, myself included, expected a, a big jump from Donovan Ali and Dejon Stribling. Those did not happen. Um, they had injuries. Renard Bell was banged up. Rob Farrell was banged up. I'm not sure that it was a great fit for Lincoln Victor in terms of what he's able to do, that, that offense that Morris ran. And then, you know, for any Coop fan will tell you that they never want to see a bubble screen <laughs> run ever again because it was such, <clears throat> excuse me, it was such an emphasis last year and it just didn't work. And obviously they had to run them sometimes because the offensive line couldn't protect. But it, it just, it, it was a, there was a lot of things kind of contributing. They had some injuries to the running backs, Nakia Watson and Jalen Jenkins missed time. It was a lot of things I think contributed to saying that this was not the offense that was hoped for just because no one was quite at the level that they were supposed to be at. Besides, I, I give Watson credit. He performed to where you would want him to be and probably above that. But everyone else was just kind of a step below or a couple steps below where you expected. For sure. So they bring in a new play caller in, in, in Ben Arbuckle. What what changes did we're able to see in spring? How will this offense look distant or uh, different just stylistically? Well, I think the first thing that I noticed, not even from a style standpoint, is that Cam Ward's footwork is completely different. Last year, it was all backpedal. Um, it was just backpedal, 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 backpedal. And Arbuckle came in, and the first thing they worked on was take your three-step drop, take your five-step drop. You can't start backpedaling. That's when you get into trouble. So that alone, I think, is going to open up more of what they can do offensively. 
from a stylistic standpoint, there weren't many bubble screens, and that was such a huge part of Morris's offense. But there's a lot of tunnel screens. There's a lot of, you know, wide receiver screens that aren't of the bubble variety, you know, getting them involved in other ways. There was some trickery involved. And then I think there's just the, the short passes. You know, the the offense I looked to last year was the way that uh, Kalen DeBoer and Ryan Grubb ran UW's offense. Drop, throw, drop, throw, eight yards, nine yards, and then stretch yeah. the field. There was a lot of that during the spring where Ward takes three steps, someone runs an out route, he hits them for seven, eight yards. Uh, and I think part of that's going to be the receivers – are going to do a better job of getting open. They just didn't do a good job of that last year. And I think <clears throat> having a completely different receiver room is going to help in that regard. But I think Arbuckle is going to want to stretch the field more. And that's the one thing that Ward still has to work on. I think, uh, I think via PFF, he was either worst or second worst in the country last year on throws over 20 yards. And we didn't see a lot of that during the spring. He it was a little bit better, but that's kind of the big thing during the summer that, okay, he's got to be able to get to that point where he can stretch the field because it opens up so much more of the offense. You know, half the reason last year the bubble screens failed so miserably is because there wasn't a threat to go down the field. Teams just, you know, press at the line. They're able to blow everything up. But I think that Arbuckle just has a little more creativity in what he wants to do. And, you know, we just have seen a few more, again, some trick plays, um, some shorter, just simpler routes instead of complicating everything or running one play over and over and over again until it, a fails a thousand times and B has every kook fan pulling their hair out. <laughs> for for sure. I, I would you say that what Arbuckle wants to do is closer to what Kim Ward ran back at Incarnate Word? I would say so. And I and I think okay. that's you know the reason Ward was able to do that and Morris was able to do that was because the competition level is different. The offensive line's not getting caved in. The receiver plays better relative to level. I think that's more of what he wants to do. I, I kind of call it it's kind of a mixture between what Mike Leach ran and between what Eric Morris ran. So it's not the you're going to run four verts 95 times a game and and pass 100,000 times a game, but it's not going to be bubble screen, bubble screen, bubble screen, bubble screen. It's a little bit of a, of a variation. Um, and obviously Arbuckle has a lot more uh, run game in his than, than Leach did, probably about the same as Morris. But also the tight ends really weren't involved last year, and part of that was they're getting installed. They hadn't been at Washington State in a decade. Arbuckle used them pretty regularly in his offense this year. Even if they're not catching passes, there was a lot more 11 or 12 personnel. It makes a lot of sense. There's, there's just so many kind of unique stats that stand out about, about this team. I mean, like they were almost never blitzed. They, they had one of like the lowest blitz faced pressure rates, which to me just suggests it's just geo break from the D line from the word go a lot of times. And then Ward was kind of especially bad at avoiding pressure when he had it. But at the same time, like to me, that feels like, if it's immediate pressure, that's different than like eventual pressure, right? It's kind of hard to avoid it if you just get it right from the jump and if if there's nobody open. Um, and you're right, like their downfield passing stuff was was pretty sketchy. Uh, they do lose uh, Stribling and Farrell, but they bring in Josh Kelly. They bring in Kyle Williams. Are, I assume those guys will play prominent roles. Are, are there any young guys that we should know about? I watched the spring game. Sheffield kind of looked pretty good, man. Like, is he going to – we we think that's going to carry over for uh, for the fall? I would say so. We, you know, DT is an interesting one as a Juco guy that we saw flashes like he showed in the spring game. He had a scrimmage like that too, and, and just unbelievably fast. I mean, electric with the ball. His one issue was drops sometimes. Now, they weren't frequent to be like, uh, that's a real problem, but there were a couple occasions where ball hits his hands and hits the turf. So he's a guy who I think will figure in very heavily in the slot. Uh, Kelly will be a big factor. Wanted to see a little more from Williams in the spring. He, again, wasn't bad by any means, but maybe didn't have quite the impact that I think we were expecting early on. Um, now, the spring doesn't always tell us a whole lot. Fall camp might be a better indicator. But the other two guys to watch, uh, Zion Nunnally, who was – this is his third year with the team. Big, talented receiver. He's fast. He's athletic. He couldn't catch the ball last year. I think he had four drops and, like, nine targets. The drops seem to have disappeared because he was really steady – um, he had another, he had a really good spring game. He had a massive scrimmage the week before. I think he had four catches, 148 yards, a couple touchdowns. Then the other one is Carlos Hernandez, a prep signee to an early enrollee freshman. And this guy was, it was almost like watching a young Gabe Marks and maybe not to that talent level yet, but he's feisty. He's fiery. I mean, he's a guy who, as Dickert pointed out a few times, he should be preparing for, for prom here in, in a couple of weeks. And he's out there going up against, you know, college corners and guys a lot bigger and stronger than him but 
He didn't back down from anyone. He was one of their better blockers on the outside. And then, you know, we we talked about him a lot in the spring. Lo and behold, his first catch in the spring game, he fumbles. He comes back, though, ends up with four catches for 70 yards. He's a guy who I think at this point is going to figure into the rotation. Probably won't start or play a ton of snaps, but the way he performed in the spring, I don't think they'll be able to keep him off the field. He was one of their better receivers from day one until day 15. That, that's that's awesome to know then. Uh, offensive line last year, you mentioned it was just legitimately poor. Um, are we expecting big improvement this year? I, I think purely because I don't know how much worse it could get, but um, obviously the big one to replace was Jarrett Kingston at left tackle, and it wasn't a great line with him. It was really not a good line without him. Um, and he's obviously off to UFC, USC. Um, you know, Connor Gomnes has taken some big strides and has really emerged as the leader at, at center. Um, I think Falili Famo ha, has locked down the right tackle spot. Um, so then it's kind of a, a four-man battle for three spots. You've got Essa Pole and Christian Hilborn at left tackle. You've got Maake Fafita and Christian Hilborn at left guard. And you've got Christian Kanu and Maake Fafita at right guard. So it's going to be who's the best of those of those three or those four that earn the starting spots. Now, none of, again, the offensive line got better throughout the spring. You know, the first scrimmage they gave up, I think it was 11 sacks or something. It was it was bad. Um, and, and granted, this is without full contact and um, and so on. But, you know, when you give up 11 sacks in a scrimmage and Ron Stone and Brennan Jackson don't play, okay, that's probably not great. It got better in the second scrimmage. I think it was down to four or five. And then by the spring game, the starting line only gave up two sacks. Those came on the last couple plays, I think, with uh, with Emmett Brown in the game and he fumbled one of the snaps. So. It got better, and then the key is going to be okay. Who's your left tackle? If it's I, th- to me, it's Pole. I think he has in the lead right now. He's a, you know, his brother played at, at Wazoo. Was a, had a you know pretty iconic pick in the 2012 Apple Cup, um, and he's uh, Pole is loud. He's I mean he's got this war cry. You stand next to him, you're going to need you know hearing aids. It, it's <laughs> it is loud, but he's huge, six seven three twenty five. Only his third year playing football, but. He has, he's very easy to mold, and I think he's kind of right up the alley of what McGuire has done in the past. And then I think Hilborn will win the left guard job. I think he's got enough experience. He's improved so much from his, you know, disastrous Sun Bowl debut back in, in 21. And then it comes down to Nkanu and Fafita at right guard. Fafita's a returner. He's played a lot at Washington State. And Kanu's kind of, a you know, more the highly touted transfer from Southern Utah. They rotated a lot. Fafita was getting more of the reps late in the spring. And Kanu got him early. So I think it'll come down to those two at right guard. But I could be completely wrong, and I, none of that could be true. But that's just kind of my my feel of the situation, um, is that you'll see Pole at left tackle, Hillborn at left guard, and then Kanu and, and Fafita at right guard. And, you know, the hope is that it's it's not going to all of a sudden become, you know, uh, the greatest offensive line of all time. But I think it'll certainly be better than what it was uh, last year because, it again, it, it can't get a whole lot worse than what it was. Yeah, I mean, definitely one of the worst in in power five. I I guess there's sort of a distinction with this schedule. Uh, before we get to defense, I, I just just taking a look at this. You know, it, like returning to a bowl game is obviously important. You want to do more than that, but like there are certain games you identify where like you don't need to be a good offensive line. You just need to be competent, and then you figure like this defense and, and the offense will score enough. Like, in Northern Colorado, Colorado State, both Arizona schools, both the Northern California schools, and Colorado, right? Like that's. Those are sort of you. You need need to hit those layups if you if you want to call them layups to to get to a bowl. And then, sort of, if the line is a little bit better than below average, if they can get to like below average plus or average, then maybe you can pick off, you know, Oregon State, UCLA, Washington, you know, say Oregon, like something like that. Like to me, it, the schedule is kind of or, you know, Wisconsin. We'll see how they look. Obviously, Washington State, their D line played really well last year in in beating those guys. Um, I don't know. Like the schedule kind of splits to me, like like pretty, like it's sort of a defined six and six almost. As far right, as, like, and I I think when you look at last year, they beat everyone with the exception of Wisconsin. They beat everyone they should have beat. I mean, they yeah. they didn't have the, they didn't get run into a trap game or run into a game where how the heck did we lose that? They just didn't beat anyone again outside of Wisconsin. That was, on, I mean, they didn't beat the top end of the Pac-12. Um, you know, they lost to Oregon, USC, Oregon State, Washington. Um, Utah, and I think when you look at this year, for them to do that, as you said, there it's going to have to take a better offensive line play because the key part of all of those losses was the offensive line wasn't good enough. I mean, you look at the USC game, and uh, you know, I, I remember joking with my dad a couple weeks ago during the draft that 
there was no highlights from the USC Wazoo game when, when Tuli Tui Pelotu got drafted. They they had one from 2021, but <laughs> he had four sacks in that game. You could have just – that could have been his highlight package. You don't need to show anything else. Um, and then you look at what – the defense old, played its butt off in that game. Yeah. The defense and then, and like, like you stopped Caleb Williams that many times – like that's got to be frustrating for the defense. Just like, right, guys, come right. On. Like again, like we're going to stop the Heisman winner. Like, yeah. Hold I, I, I watched that, that off that was... thirty points. That's that's a victory. No um, doubt. And in the Coliseum you... too, if I recall. Right, right. Yeah. You know, you hold Utah. Granted, without rising, without uh, I think Tavion Thomas was out for that game. Without just about everybody, you hold them to twenty-one, but you can't get the offense because they're providing pressure with the reeds and with Fillinger. Um, you know, you look at the Oregon game and it's, uh, you know, a mixture of everybody coming down. And then you look at the Washington game and Braylon Trice and Jeremiah Martin and ZTF, they all get, they all get home. And, um, you know, in Oregon state, it was, it was, again, it was everybody, everyone was in the backfield at one point or another. So, and then you look at the games they won and well, yeah, Ward basically stayed upright the entire game, Arizona, Stanford, ASU, they couldn't generate pressure. Even Wisconsin as great as Herbig was. He didn't have a massive game like you maybe would have thought he would have against that offensive line. So it, it's the key to the offensive success. If they're going to pick off one of those big teams, you know, no USC or Utah this year, but if they're going to pick off UCLA or they're going to, you know, get one of the Oregon schools, the offensive line is going to have to hold up. So last year, this is the best Washington State defense in 15 years. I think we could say like maybe like playing Utah with it without rising juices the numbers a little bit, but still like. I don't think I recall a better Washington State defense. I mean, they've got like a couple legitimate pros on, on, or at least had, and still have some. I don't know. Does it feel like they kind of wasted that a little bit because the offense just couldn't get it going? And like, like that's got to be the feeling. They don't want to do that again. Like they have right. to you know, kind of step up. And the only thing this defense did poorly last year was it occasionally gave up the bomb, maybe a little too frequently. Like, like you could get over the top of them if you could get it blocked up, I guess. But I mean, Jackson and Stone. I'm not sure if our listeners know because I mean some some go to bed and Washington State is not like a big time national program. These guys got some real pass rush juice to them, right? And I think it was you know um, it was somewhat of maybe an eight or nine win defense and just a five or six win offense last year. And it you know you look at a game like again like USC, you hold Caleb Williams to thirty, you should be in that game. You hold Oregon State on the road to, to twenty four. You should be in that game. You hold Utah to 21, you should be in that game. You know, the one game that they – the two games they really let down, uh, Oregon, and, and even then there was a pick six involved and Oregon scored a late touchdown. And then obviously the Apple Cup where the offense still did some of its job and then, you know, UW's offense was just that good last year. But you look at the rest of the games and, you know, on, on especially when you consider that there were games where the Cougar offense would come out firing. They would score – you know, they were up, 20, I think, 28 nothing on ASU at half. That game was a 28-18 game, and had it not been, you know, for the clock running out, that could have gotten a lot closer. And the defense had to hold, really, until it started just to get tired late. You know, you look at Arizona even, great, yeah, it's 31 nothing at one point, you know, one of which the defense scored. Arizona makes a push late. Um, you know, it, it, you look at Cal, they score 21 point, or 28 points on Cal, have to score two touchdowns late, and the defense kind of holds off, so... It was the best defense I had seen from a Washington State team since I started school in 2015. So that's, you know, eight seasons now. Uh, the 17 defense was good early and then kind of let down as the season wore on. That had Hercules Mataafa. It had some, um, Frankie Luvu, <clears throat> some really good players. But, you know, I, I think there was some what of a feeling from, you know, and obviously no one would ever say it from the defensive side, but that, yeah, that they could have won more games if the offense was just, a little bit better. I mean, if you had one of the, I mean, gosh, you combine one of those leech offenses with that defense, that's a nine or 10 win team. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that was a better defense, I think, than the, than the 18 defense that won 11 games. And granted they won 11 games largely because of Gardner Minshew, but that was a solid defense that year. I mean, even, you know, you look at the games they lost one was, you know, USC on the road, which was just a weird game with, uh, with penalties and targeting and so on. And then they lost the Apple cup and you'd have only scored 28 points in that game. It was just the offense that let down. So I, I think that it was a, a really good defense. And obviously it's going to be a different defense, though. You know, you you lose two really good linebackers. Uh, you lose a starting corner. You lose your star nickel. So I, I think it's going to be different. But I also think it still has the potential to be a very good defense. It's just going to have to be good in a different way. I was going to ask you about that. So, I, I mean, just kind of working front to back here. Stone and Jackson are back, which is great. But you do lose, I mean – 
1100 1200 snaps of defensive tackle play like the, the top three guys there on the interior are are gone it how much of a step back will they will they see there that's a good question and i think i'm not sure how big it will be and okay. you know as experienced as pule mujahid and mejia were i wouldn't say any of them were game breakers they were good players um and they had good careers but I think what you're going to see from Washington State at the defensive tackle position is hopefully a little more of the dynamic game breaker type hmm. in terms of pass rush. You know, Nusi Milani and David Gusta, the projected starters right now, I'd be pretty stunned if it wasn't the two of them. They're pretty, pretty electric in how they can get to the quarterback. Um, and they and, played and last saw, year some too. I mean, it's not like yeah, they yeah. snaps. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And, and we saw it a little bit last year at times. Um, but I think more snaps could produce more sacks from that position. You got Naeem Rodman coming from Colorado. He'll be more of the space eater, just kind of stick him in the middle of the defense. Um, and then you've got some young guys. You got Rashad McKenzie, who was a, a big time recruit at one point in the class of, I think it was 22, had some great issues. His recruitment kind of dried up. Washington State swooped in late and got him. Really, really athletic kid. His status is a little up in the air. He was injured during spring ball. Not sure the severity of that. Uh, Ansel Dinba was a freshman, an early enrollee, who didn't look like a freshman. I mean, he was 285 pounds coming in and had some really good pass rushing moves. Not expecting a whole lot from him as a freshman, but might see some snaps. And then so the maybe guy not a huge of, drop off. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was saying so. Maybe not a huge drop off there at, at defensive tackle. That makes right. Sense. Right. All right. The next spot on my sheet that I'm very well, probably the most concerning thing to me. Henley was that dude was a dude, and, and I mean, like a legitimate great college football player. And the practice reports out of University of Miami are that Francisco Maui Goa is totally killing it there. So it's not that Washington State can't have backups that play to that level, but I feel like it's unlikely that they're going to have a, a, a linebacker do it. Those guys were all over the field. I mean, the, like havoc rates in the two and a half percent range for both your linebackers, and you know, losing what fifteen tackles for loss and almost 20 run stops in addition to all the pass lane stuff. That was what is there hope of like getting like comp play for one of the guys, maybe like that, that feels like, like a big drop off. I, I think, <clears throat> I, I just don't think there's a, a realistic scenario in which they can replace that with ease. It's it just, and it's not an indictment on the guys they have, but again, you're talking about a guy who's going to go start at Miami and a guy who was a third round pick. I mean, those are not easy guys to replace. It doesn't matter if you're Washington state or, I mean, okay, Alabama can probably do it with these, but Washington State isn't anybody who's not Georgia is going to struggle with that. Basically, yeah. basically, yeah. we're you know insert NFL linebacker probably going to the Eagles every year. Um, but uh, you know they did bring in a couple transfers. They got Ahmad McCullough from Maryland and and Devin Richardson from Texas, and they had they had strong springs. Not to Henley's degree, wouldn't say that. Um, but you know, guys who look like okay, they're going to be able to fill in and play and, and not be just you know liabilities out there. Again, they're not going to have the playmaking ability of Henley at least based off what we saw in the spring. But it, it's not going to just be like, oh, my God, what happened? Um, and then you got Kyle Thornton returning, good veteran guy, good leader in the room. And then you got a couple youngsters. You got uh, Tariq Al-Ukta. He was, uh, I think, a borderline four-star recruit in 2022. Uh, was injured all last year, didn't play. He had some really impressive moments during the spring. And then Hudson Cedarland from uh, from Gig Harbor played a little bit last year, didn't do a whole lot, um, but had a really good spring. He's kind of the guy who – it would replace Mangoa's thump ability. Now, I mean, Mangoa was just such a heavy hitter. Cedarland doesn't have the explosiveness yet or the speed, but he can really, really hit. And, and I think with those five guys, it's going to be more of a by committee. Last year, it was it was Mangoa, it was Henley, and then a little bit of Travion Brown who went to ASU. He's not difficult to replace. They replaced him, in my opinion. Um so it's going to be more of a, of a five-man team, I think. And and they're still poking around at transfer linebackers. Um, I think they would like to get one more in there. But I think it'll be more of the by committee. And then, you know, do you, how do you replace Henley's tackles for loss? You're not going to get it from one guy. You just don't have that guy. It, it's going to be, you know, a money ball. Replace it on the aggregate uh, of what you lost in, in OBP. This guy has three tackles for loss. This guy has four. So you get five guys with four tackles for loss. Now, that doesn't replace the individual impact Henley has, but that's how they're going to have to replace what you lost in him. It's just a little bit from everyone kind of coming together. But even with that, again, you, you just don't replace someone like Dayon Henley that easily. It's just, you know, because so much of what he did doesn't even show up on a stat sheet because of how explosive and how disruptive he was. Oh, for sure. Uh, in the back end, 
a pretty good secondary. Occasionally, like, like we said, it was you know a little bit liable to give up the bomb, maybe at inopportune times. But losing Marsh and Langford, replaceable in your opinion? Like they almost never came off the field, which is why I guess I mark it down as a concern. Seven hundred fifty snaps for both is uh, is a lot. But, but how do you feel about that unit? Marsh will not be easy to replace. I mean, I, I think you saw in the Apple Cup what happened when he wasn't out there, and it was. It was bad, and uh, you know, and the guy who started that game, Armani Archie, he's transferred to UConn. So you had three guys competing in the spring. That was Jackson Latimua, who's a fourth-year guy. He's been around the program a while, mostly been a special teamer. Uh, Chris Jackson was a Michigan State transfer from a couple years ago. Was playing corner. They moved into nickel, and then Kapenagushkin, a JC transfer, wicked speed. I forget what it was, but some kind of ridiculous uh, forty-yard dash time, something like okay. the four threes. Those are kind of the three guys, and. The nickel play was decent in the spring. It wasn't great. It certainly was not to the level of Armani Marsh. And I think the coaches know it's not to the level of Armani Marsh. And that's where they probably need to get someone close to. That's a position battle that even Jordan Malone, the nickels coach, said, we'll decide that battle when we send the first guy out on the first snap of the season. I mean, I think it'll come down to the absolute wire. Um, they all have a little bit of something that that works in their favor. Gushkin's got speed. Jackson's got the physicality. And then a lot of you has got kind of the experience and just the knowledge of playing nickel. So I don't know how they're going to be able to replace Marsh. I don't think it'll be easy, but I think if you can get a guy who's just at least can be in the same ballpark as him, you'll be okay. If you have the same level of play you had in the Apple Cup last year, and again, I didn't mean no disrespect to Armani Archie, but it it will be a tough it'll be tough sledding. Um, as for the corner spot, you know, you obviously it hurts to lose Langford, but you bring back Shaw Smith Wade, who was one of the best corners in the country uh, per PFF last year. And you've got really two guys competing for that other job. You got Cam Lampkin, uh, transferred from Utah State, didn't play a lot last year. Wasn't great when he played. He had a really good spring, looked a, a lot better. He talked uh, to us kind of about how his mentality changed, how his kind of his drive changed, and he looked like a different player. Then you got a youngster, Javen Robinson, who had a really good fall camp last year, um, <clears throat> had a good spring last year, and then, or excuse me, had a good fall camp last year and then had a monster spring this year. I mean, was for the first 10 days was the best corner on the field with the exception of Smith Wade. Um, I think Lampkin has the edge in the job. He's bigger, he's stronger, he's more experienced. But Robinson's going to play. And, and this is a guy who is kind of following that Smith Wade mold where you see some flashes, you see some more flashes. And then year three, he really, really breaks out uh, next year. But he's a, a guy who, again, he's got to put on a little bit of weight. He's only about 165, 166. But he's another one of those guys. He's fearless. He doesn't mind letting an experienced receiver know when he breaks up a pass. He's got that trash talk ability. Um, and he's really, really quick guy. He's probably going to be working in on some punt returns. He's kind of the one guy to watch that I think could really be a breakout star. The problem is, is outside of those three, it gets thin. You got two JC guys, uh, Jamori Colson and Stephen Hall. Neither had a great spring. Both kind of looked a little bit behind and probably need some big summers into some fall camp to really give you a, a true four and five option. Jamie, man, this has been incredibly comprehensive. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, only, I mean, the, the punter's back, right? Yep. Harbiner? Haber, yep. The guy's an, the guy's an awesome, uh, awesome punter. So, yep. like, that's – I mean, uh, at least that'll help the defense. Last one for you. It, clearly, I think we would expect a little bit of defensive regression and hopefully some, some you know, regression to, of, of the positive nature for the offense. Is there any chance this offense ends up better than the defense, or we just don't think it'll be that that dramatic? That's a good question. Um, I think it's possible. I don't okay. know if I'd say it's likely. I mean, if again, just looking at spring ball, and obviously the defense is going to be ahead of the offense. Um, the defense really dominated the first several days. The offense did get going a little bit later <clears throat> as some of the defensive stars started. You know, Jaden Hicks started taking a few snaps. Jackson and Stone didn't take a whole lot. Smith Wade didn't take a whole lot. So then the offense all started to look a little crisper against some more second teamers. Um, I still think the defense will have the slight edge, but it wouldn't be a shocker if the offense was was better. Last year, I think it was going to be a pretty big surprise as we got through fall camp if the offense was better. It wouldn't be as surprising this year. Gotcha. Jamie, everybody needs to visit kookfan.com. I don't think anybody in the world could give me a better rundown on Washington State unless Dickert just wants to come on here and just be super, <laughs> super honest. No, don't get Jake. I could, I, I'll tell you more than Jay. I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> Awesome, man. We'll have to have you back on the show and really appreciate the time. Awesome. Thanks, bud. Appreciate it.